Trade Secrets is brought to you by Ruder Ware, business attorneys for business success, and by the Judd S. Alexander Foundation, supporting quality of life and economic development in Marathon County. Hi, I'm Stuart Etten, president of Ruder Ware Law Firm. Without businesses, communities would not thrive. And without communities, businesses wouldn't, well, have a place to do business. At Ruder Ware Law Firm, we've been providing counsel to Wisconsin business leaders and been a big part of our community for generations. So you could say we know a little bit about what it takes for the two to work together. That's why we're honored to present Trade Secrets here on Wisconsin Eye. It's a new series that shares candid conversations between successful Wisconsin business leaders and lets you, the audience, in on what it takes to cultivate both business and community in our great state. From Ruder Ware, thanks for watching and enjoy the show. One CEO travels to a company to meet another CEO and gets a tour. They talk business, challenges, share stories. Then the host CEO travels to another company, meets the new CEO, gets the tour. They talk business, challenges, share stories. Then we do it all over again. You get the picture. A chain of CEOs traveling around the state, meeting each other, talking business, sharing stories. That's Trade Secrets, CEO to CEO. Hello, my name is Matt Jennings, President and CEO of Philips Metasize. I'm here today to talk to David Britting of Britting Manufacturing Company to learn a little more about his business. Join me while we go for a tour. Before we do, a little history. Entrepreneurial spirit, attention to marketplace, and family. These are the bedrock qualities that weave through the history of Britting Manufacturing. Christopher George Bredding immigrated to New York in 1880. After stints as an Ohio meatpacker and a North Dakota railroad worker, C.G. Bredding moved his family in 1888 to a town some envisioned as the new Chicago, Ashland, Wisconsin. Within two years, he was superintendent of Parrish Manufacturing, had purchased the company, and renamed it C.G. Bredding Manufacturing. The company prospered by manufacturing machinery for the world's largest concentration of sawmills, and thus was the beginning of what has become a 125-year legacy of entrepreneurial spirit and success. In 1904, C.G. Bredding passed away, leaving his wife and 17-year-old son Ralph to run the company. With the pine forest depleted and the sawmill industry in decline, Breading Manufacturing transitioned to building equipment for a new, thriving industry, iron ore. In 1926, C.G. Breading's youngest son, Lyman, returned to Ashland with an engineering degree from MIT, joining his brother Ralph in the business. By 1929, Lyman was president and general manager, diversifying the company with the design and manufacture of paper converting equipment. With the mining industry in decline in the 1950s, a third generation Bredding took over leadership, with Tad Bredding transforming the company into a pioneer in the paper conversion industry, developing the first automatic napkin folder. In 1997, the innovation and success of the company surged with fourth generation family members. David Bredding was named Chief Executive Officer and his brother, Paul, Chief Operating Officer. Their father, Tad, was inducted into the Paper Industry International Hall of Fame. Today, the fifth generation of Breddings joined this remarkable enterprise, now with over 400 employees. Their entrepreneurial spirit and attention to marketplace expands Breddings' footprint to clients worldwide. Not to mention its continued commitment to a community some might know better for tourism than the economic engine breading manufacturing is to Ashland and northern Wisconsin. Hi, Matt. David Breading. Hey, Pleasure David. To Pleased to meet you. Thank yeah. you for having me today. And welcome to Breading Manufacturing. I appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedule to come and see us today. But how about we go for a quick tour? Sounds great. I'm looking forward to it. Right. Ready Manufacturing's got a lot of history, and this is our, our Hall of History 
which includes photos of my grandfather, my great-grandfather, some of their various family members. Being a 125-year-old company wow. in our fifth generation is, is pretty unique in today's world. Not many companies even make it to the third. Well, that's quite an accomplishment. Started with my great-grandfather. My great-grandfather died in the World's Fair in 1906, and his wife actually took over and ran the company. That's and fantastic. So it was kind of cool to have a woman in charge of a manufacturing facility for nearly 20 years. You guys were way ahead of your time. Yeah, it was a pretty unique time. Yeah. It was pretty cool. That's fantastic. And then when my grandfather graduated from MIT, um, he came back. He got a degree in engineering to come back to run the company. And then my father, uh, who uh, graduated from Notre Dame in 58, played baseball there, played with Carl Ustremski, got drafted into the majors, ended up hurting his arm, had a chance to either come back and run the company or go back and try to make it back into the majors and uh, I guess we're pretty lucky he came back to, to yeah. run the company. Well that's awesome to be able to see five generations still involved yeah. in the business. It is, we're lucky, very very lucky. Uh, these are all pencil drawings from you know the late 1800s but this truly is horsepower. Four one to four horses, it was a winch and you'd either hook up one horse or four horses. I mean the drawings are like a work of art. Yeah, they, and they are. It's incredible, you, you couldn't do that on a computer today. All done with pencil. Wow. Pretty cool stuff. This is one floor of our engineering. We have two floors of engineering. This is mostly mechanical engineering in this area. We use all SolidWorks product, 3D modeling, those type of things. We've got about 100 folks in engineering. Wow. Um, all of our machinery is custom designed, custom built, uh, per order. So, a lot of good things. Now, where do most of your engineers come from? We get a bunch out of Wisconsin, a lot out of northern Michigan, a lot out of Michigan Tech, Platteville, uh, a lot of local kids. Mm -hmm. We get folks that come out of Ironwood, uh, Hurley area also. Yeah. So all the equipment has to be, since it's custom made, to fit in your customer's plant. So they have to take all of that into consideration when they're designing the product? Right. When you get the layout, you may have a column, you may have a hallway, you may have something in the way. So. These guys work with the customers uh, in order to make sure they fit it, and plus all the new developments in R&D that we do too. A lot of folks are involved in that on a daily basis. So it looks like we're going into some of the areas that also gets involved in service and support? Yeah, this area has got service support. There's probably 30 people in here that take customer calls both for questions on how the machine is operating, to parts, all those type of things, to get spare parts, something breaks, get something sent out. So I imagine that's a, a, a pretty important part of your, your business? Yeah, it's probably number one. We're known globally uh, for our service and getting parts out, getting people out. Our staff of nearly 40, 45 service people, if you call this morning from Saudi Arabia, you call from Germany, you call from Green Bay, you need somebody there, we'll have somebody dispatched that same day flying uh, to your location because that's what costs customers money, downtime. Well, I guess for products like yours that might be used 24-7, the machines are constantly running, knowing that they have a safety net like your group behind them is probably pretty important. Yeah, we, we basically are 24-7. They can call in here. Um, we have a setup that they can get to an electrical engineer, a mechanical engineer, a field service mechanical, field service electrical, 24-7 uh, phone support globally to help them out. I know in my personal business where we have, you know, equipment, um, you know, sometimes the decisions made on, you know, who's going to be there when you need them most. Yeah. And it sounds like that's a big focus of yours. It's very similar. That started when we really got into the world of converting in the early 60s with my dad. One of the main points was we got to service this stuff. We've got to be the company based on service that everybody else is measured by. And that's our constant goal. Globally, it doesn't matter where you are. That's a great slogan, a standard by which others are measured by, huh? Every day. <laughs> Every day. That's and that, that's true. And you'll see the lean process. Everything has its place. This is our DMU. Uh, it's probably one of the most complicated machine tools you're going to find anywhere. It's sunk nearly 12 foot in the floor uh, and weighs nearly 60,000 plus pounds making parts for ourselves, for our own equipment, and parts for food service, military, mining, etc. Wow, this is a big piece of equipment, and I imagine the floor has to be rock stable for it to be able to 
cut through that steel. Yeah, when the guys put in the footings for it and poured the cement below it, uh, they were laughing that they're going to change the rotation of the earth. <laughs> I mean, it's amazing. It's so accurate, and it needs to be for our customers. Now, it looks like it's moving on a number of different axes, so this is a pretty sophisticated piece of equipment. Right, it's five axis, and the, the folks that run it here are just brilliant. They've gone to the tech school, the local tech school here in Ashland, superior one or two year degrees. And in today's world, we really promote, we go to the schools, we talk to the kids about how manufacturing isn't down, dumb, and dirty. It takes skills, reading skills, math skills, uh, being able to talk to folks, uh, to be able to make a difference. Being able to train and get good talent to be able to run this sophisticated equipment uh, is really key. It's great to know that you've got some of that here locally. Yeah, we've got a great support staff with the WITC, the folks over in Ironwood at Gogibic. Uh, we work, like I said, big time with the high schools, and now we're even moving that down to the grade schools to, to talk to kids that manufacturing isn't dead in Wisconsin. It's the number one employer in the state of Wisconsin is manufacturing, you know, as you know. Yeah, no, absolutely. We do a lot of this. What we're looking at right now is one of our water jet cutters. Uh, it's one of our probably nearly 60 pieces of machinery. This is making the parts that uh, we engineer and design that go into our equipment, plus we use it for our contract machining business where we machine parts for other industries, from mining to food, uh, mold making, medical, military, etc. It cuts with about 80,000 PSI uh, water. It runs uh, pretty much 24-7. It's very large. It has two tables. So after the guy on night shift gets done, uh, he'll set up the machine and it'll run the next six to eight hours on its own. So lights out. Lights out machine. And we do a lot of lights out machining on our bigger machine tools, or we do also a lot of two folks running one machine because of the length of cuts on some of our big, big gantries. Now we have um, a small water cutter, it, like very small. This is the largest water cutter, cutter I've seen, is it? it? It is one of the larger ones you can buy. It has two full tables. And uh, again, our goal with Lean is 10 minutes between chip time to chip time on any machine, on any part. So from the time one part is done, cutting chips, the machine is done, the next setup, the next routine needs to happen in 10 minutes. You know, what's always amazing to me is that the engineers figured out a way to have water actually cut steel. And we can cut through inch, inch and a half. It's amazing, we've cut a lot of plastics on it. Uh, a lot of uh, exotic type uh, plastics that go into our machinery. You mentioned this, you do some contract manufacturing, or contract um, manufacturing, manufacturing uh, molds and things like that? Yeah, we do. Uh, you'll see some stainless molds laying around. Some as big as uh, eight feet by 30 feet, big hunk of stainless steel that's two and a half feet thick. That could take uh, 200, 300 hours of machining time alone. Wow. To stuff for the mining industry again, big stuff to the military. And we also do some little stuff on some of our smaller high speed CNCs also. That's really amazing. The size of this and to be able to do that. Well, I guess that's critical to your business because you're making big big equipment. Yeah, big equipment, but each machine that we build might have 2,500 individual parts in it. From big huge rolls that are three meters long to little tiny parts that are you know one inch long. All integral to the process of making a napkin or making a paper towel, yep. which still amazes people. Somebody's got to make the machinery for folks to make napkins. Okay, what this is, uh, Matt, this is a box facial line. This is what we design, engineer, manufacture here. 85% of what you see on this machine is built here at Breddick, from shafts, guarding, everything. It's unrolling two very large rolls of paper at about 700 feet per minute making facial tissue. And it's considered an automatic line. When it comes out the end, it's cut into its individual plates. I mean, it looks like it's going really fast. How fast is it pulling that tissue? A little over 700 feet per minute. It's pulling a very thin tissue. So it runs off the unwind stands, 
come through some combiner and bos come through a combiner, and then it moves into the folding head where the actual folding process takes place. You can see them of that in there where it's actually building a log, separating it, building a log, separating it, and then it's bringing it along as its individual packs, and it's going into one of our high-speed accumulators. So that's what this big stack here is right. a, an accumulator? It accumulates the product because what's downstream of our equipment, uh, maybe a box that it goes in, may jam. It only takes two or three minutes to fix that jam. Well, that allows them to fix that jam and for us to keep running full board. That way, um, you can kind of load this up, and I imagine this box is at the other end a little faster than it's coming out here? Right, about 10% faster. It'll cut up to 280 clips, individual clips a minute. And this is all made right here? It's all made here, all designed, manufactured, programmed here at Bredy. So I imagine you run these, test them all out, to make sure they're just, just right for your customer. And then based on what you are saying before, you'll train them and then you dismantle it and send right. it to them? It's all engineered. The customer will come in for a checkout once we're ready. They'll check you know, product quality, make sure everything meets their specs, what they wanted. And then we'll tear it down and ship it. We have had, if it's going foreign, it has to be engineered a little bit different because it has to go in containers. We've shipped machines that have taken 35 to 40 40 foot containers just to ship. And then we'll go over sometimes to a customer site, we'll send out a crew that'll actually go out and assemble it. It's a, a beautiful piece of equipment. I mean, it runs, it seems like it's so smooth and, and it looks nice too. Well, thank you. Yeah, we take a lot of pride in, yeah, it makes napkins or it makes facial tissue, but we think it has to look good too. It's all computerized, all touch screens, there's multiple cameras that look at different spots of the machine that the operator can see from the control panel. And it's clean, which I imagine it has to operate clean if you're doing... Yep, it does. They'll go into factories where they have to wear, you know, beard masks and head masks and everything else. Makes sense. Okay, this is the final part of our tour, Matt. This is our fitness area. We have a full uh, tennis court. We also have two racquetball courts. A uh, full weight room with uh, eight or ten aerobic type equipments, all the weights. For the use of our employees, their spouses, their kids. It's open 24-7. All they got to do is ring a buzzer, sign in, they come and do any of those events anytime they want to. This is fantastic, Dave. So why do you do this? Well, I always tell people we're a family of ex-jocks. That's number one. We've had all this stuff since about 1985. But for, for the employees, for their families, we think it's pretty important. You get flexible work hours, you get a good workout, and a, you know, a healthier employee truly is a, a better asset for us. Makes a lot of sense. Yeah, and we have a full, uh, we have a nurse also on staff that works with the employees. You have a lot of fitness challenges. Try to stay in shape, try to work out, uh, try to be better physical fit people. Sounds like a real competitive group. Oh yeah, the CrossFit group's coming out in a few minutes. That's one competitive group. Dave, thanks a lot for the tour today. This is fantastic. You're welcome. Let's head up to a conference room and talk for a little bit. That'd be great. Perfect. So David, again, thank you so much for the, the tour and uh, seeing the operations. It was fantastic. I thought maybe you could share uh, a little bit about the history and your lineage and so forth. I mean, it's such a fantastic story. Well, it was my pleasure having you uh, today to, to come through Breading Manufacturing. Uh, we're in our fifth generation. We're 125 years old. I'm fourth. My son and my brother Paul, who is the CEO of the company, run on a daily basis. And our nephew, uh, Sean, uh, started also both as mechanical engineers this last year to begin our fifth generation. We've We've had our ups and downs. You know, any business that's 125 years old is, is going to have that. But we're located right on the shores of Lake Superior. Um, started out working in the sawmill industry. We were a foundry. Uh, then when all the trees were cut in northern Wisconsin, it became the mining industry. So we were heavily into the mining, even to when my dad started into the mining. But in the late 50s is when we got into the world of paper converting. and. Uh, started producing our own equipment and that's what we pretty much do today except for our contract machining side which is custom machining for other markets like food, 
military, mining, etc. Well, it's amazing over the, the decades, uh, the different businesses you've been in or the company's been in, they've had to continually look at reinventing itself and what they're going to do next. And I noticed you mentioned in addition to the equipment you do, you're doing some contract manufacturing. Is that something that you started to do relatively recently or? Yeah, I mean, our roots were really in the, in when we started, you know, in the sawmill and the mining, that's a lot of the stuff that we did and then we went away from that and we started the contract machining getting back into it about 10, 15 years ago. With the breadth of the machine tools we have, the investment in some of the machine tools we have, to keep those babies running 24-7 is pretty important. Yeah, I can see a big, big investment, a lot of technology that's pretty sophisticated. Talk to me a little bit about, you know, the people and, and what kinds of people, um, you know, come and work here at Reading. Yeah, we're always uh, we're always looking out for great engineering folks. Uh, we've got electrical engineering, mechanical engineering, computer engineering. Um, the folks in the shop are very talented. Uh, we work heavily with the vocational schools, the high schools, even down to the grade schools now, to to show people that in Wisconsin, where manufacturing is huge, that it's not down, dumb, and dirty. It's a, it's a great wage. It's a great industry. And people still do make stuff. And, you know, in, in, in the U.S., you know, they talk about the service industries. They talk about all those type of things that are non-non-manufacturing. But manufacturing really is, uh, especially in the state of Wisconsin, one of the major backbones of this great state. Out on the platform, uh, the, our last spot that we, we visited was the, the, the gym and the exercise equipment. And one of the things that you said there is that I think we were laughing about how competitive some of the your 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 teammates are mm -hmm. within here at Britting. You know, maybe you can talk a little bit about being competitive and being competitive on the global stage, continuing to be innovative and really not getting complacent. Yeah, we think that's a key and we're always talking about it. When, when you're successful, any company is successful, it's easy to, to sit at that top rung or the top one or two, three percent and say, hmm, I've made it now. I've arrived. <clears throat> we all know of many, many companies out there that have become dinosaurs. They, uh, they don't invest in their people. They haven't invested in their equipment, buildings, uh, the latest and greatest technologies. And, you know, I tell any business today, if, if you want to die the slow death, mm. become that fat, dumb, and happy, complacent company that's not willing to, to innovate. And it's not me doing the innovation. It's driving that passion into your engineering group, your group on the floor, even down as far as the, the, the guy or gal running that machine tool. Those are some of the best and brightest folks that can you know, pick up those little things that really make a difference. It can really be innovative. But uh, as soon as you become complacent, you're dead. And it's so, so true. And you know, the theme around innovation is very similar to you know, what we talk about. Our tagline is partnerships built on innovation. Mm -hmm. And it's really to communicate to everybody, our employees and uh, our customers, that we need to continue to innovate in the global marketplace. We need to look at how do we do it better and um, faster and quicker, which is what I saw uh, throughout your plant is a focus on lean, um, focus on you know, innovation. Um, and you know what I thought uh, as I look back on it is through the generations, it's kind of built in your culture around innovation. You've re-innovated yourself a couple times through the decades. So, yeah, to be, to be able to stay competitive, and I don't care if you're a, not shipping globally, you could be just a, the, the local bakery down the street or whatever, you, you got to have that edge over somebody. And it's, it's, it's an edge that's driven by, like you said, innovation. Similar to what you guys have with the innovation driving your business, that we have a same... A, almost the same thing going. It's uh, innovation and earning the right to be the customer's choice because nobody's gonna give it to you. And that's part of our mission statement, earning the right to be the customer's choice. You compete on a global basis and having to you know, compete with folks all over. And the only way you're able to do that is really to, sounds like to do it in a smarter, faster, more flexible way. And it really comes down to the, the the training, education, and, and the people. 
Yeah, getting getting good people in in Wisconsin is 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 really a blessing. The work ethic, the education base, uh, to find those people that are that that are willing to work hard, in the in especially in northern Wisconsin, is isn't that difficult. Mm. It's amazing. People talk about shortages and those type of things. Uh, we've got a lot of great folks that live in the area. We just don't recruit people out of Ashland. They come out of Hurley. Ironwood, Washburn, Bayfield. So it's kind of a, within maybe a hundred mile circle that we have employees coming to work here at Pretty Manufacturing. Mm. Spending dollars on training is very important. Uh, keeping people up to date with the latest technology, it doesn't matter if it's engineering or manufacturing or assembly, uh, makes the difference. So if, you know, I was struck by the fact that you talked about the fifth generation that's coming into the business and running it business. And, you know, I was reflecting on the fact that I've got two young girls, one is 16, and trying to think about what she's going to be doing in, in the future. What, what, you know, what, what do you have to say for some of the younger um, people that are thinking about what they want to do and r what do they really need to focus in on to be a good employee at Britting Manufacturing? Well, number one, you got to love what you do. And when I go talk to the kids, I, I just recently went talk to some eighth grade kids. And one of the questions is, don't I have to go to college to work at Breading? And I said, no. You know, a four-year four degree isn't necessary. Not everybody needs to get a four-year degree. The tech schools for welders, manufacturing, machine tools, assembly, repair, et cetera, are really, really important. And we gotta get kids to look at just not colleges we got to get them and we're trying to get them to look at the trades. Mm -hmm. We think that's important. It's good paying jobs. Most of the kids that come out of tech schools right now are immediately employed because in the state of Wisconsin there is a shortage in a lot of areas for, for manufacturing welders. Well I know in our case if there's an engineer that uh, is coming through or even like you said a trade, um, tra well trained, uh, trained trade person um, either in welding or they understand how to mold making or something like that, boy, we snap them up in a second. Yeah, we do, we do the same thing. We do a lot of uh, internships in the, uh, the summers for engineering kids that are going to Michigan Tech, going to Wisconsin, that may live uh, their families from Ashland or from, uh, to, give them a, to give them a good background of what it really is to work here. Yeah. But you're right, to, to snap up some of these bright young men and women today is, is important. Talk to me a little bit about what you see. Uh, we've talked a little bit about the history. We've talked about the importance of the people, the strong um, pool of people that are in the state of Wisconsin. But what does it look like in the next, you know, three, four, five years for printing yeah, manufacturing? We were actually just having that discussion this morning in our leadership group is because uh, <clears throat> of our long-term employees, uh, our turnovers may be one to three percent in any year, which is Includes retirements, death, disabilities, etc. We were talking that in the next three to eight years, uh, we're probably going to lose about 25% of our workforce to retirement. Yeah, so that's a little concern of ours. So that's why we're trying to be proactive, like a lot of other manufacturers, in getting kids to think of manufacturing as a career and to try to build on that, to go into the schools, to get kids to come in here for tours with classes, etc to even get the convince the parents. Uh, WITC has done a great job of having these get-togethers where they actually invite the kids and the parents to see what manufacturers do because, you know, a lot of, even the parents think manufacturing is still down, dumb, and dirty, which it isn't, which both of our businesses are, you know, very clean, very computerized, and, and you gotta be, you gotta be bright. Well, manufacturing today is uh, very high tech. You know, we use all the latest technology from all over the world to do what we do here in Wisconsin. And uh, people have to learn it and be willing to work hard, to be committed, and can work with as a team. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, I totally agree with what you were saying before, the workforce here, um, hardworking, committed, um, and you know, it's just a great environment to work. What advice do you have for folks that are looking to start their business or to venture out? You gotta have a passion. You gotta have a, a belief in, in what you wanna do. You gotta have a good business plan. Um, 
and you, and you got to have something that, 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 that you have people that you can surround yourself with on this adventure that are going to stay with you, believe in you, believe in your product, believe in your process. Also to have uh, a number one, I think, is you got to have a good accountant. <laughs> Somebody that's willing to tell you no. I, I think that's part of it. But well, what do you tell folks? I completely agree with you. I mean, um, on the comment around the passion, and you got to believe in what you're trying to get accomplished. I mean, today, just traveling through the, doing the tour here, and listening to you talk about your company, you could feel um, as much as hear the passion you have in the business. You have so many challenges you need to overcome as a part of building and growing a business. And you have so many negative messages that come across around why you can't or the challenge associated with growing the business that if you don't believe in what you do and have a passion for it and can uh, emote that to other people like you did here today, it just makes it that much harder. So having a strong passion for what you do, believing in, in it, and being able to get others to believe in that as well, I think is a big, um, a, a big characteristic that you need uh, or something you need to think about when you go and look at starting or uh, anything, you know, business right. or anything else like that. So I totally agree with you. And I, I do agree with you on the accountant. You, you need to have somebody there that can kind of, um, you know, keep you grounded and just make sure that you're on the, on the right path. And whether it's an accountant or uh, surrounding yourself, as you said, with, with smart people that can help and guide you, I think is, is always, um, always important, particularly if you're just getting started for the first time. Yeah, you see a lot of entrepreneurs today, <clears throat> they're the start, they start the company and, and they have, sometimes I call it overpassion, that they're the smartest people in the room and, and that's a, a, sometimes a, a straight line to failure. Mm. Uh, I, I, and one thing I always tell folks out there is I said, uh, what my dad always said, you know, anybody can put up bricks and mortar, but hiring people that are smarter than you, mm -hmm. that want to work harder than you, and have your passion is probably the most important. You know, the most important things for our business is our people. And uh, I like to say that when we have our executive staff meetings, the dumbest person in the room is myself. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and when I've accomplished that, I know that I've got the right team around me. So you, yeah, very, you're, very, you're right. Very similar. It's, it's one of the most important things. Yeah. So I think whenever you're, you're venturing out, um, you know, if there are folks out there that, that want to do that, one of the things I think that's also a lot of fun, and uh, I was going to ask you, you know, you do have a lot of passion for the business and you've been in it for a long time now. What keeps you getting up in the morning every day? <laughs> People ask, you know, it's amazing. That question gets asked more by uh, outside folks because to run a business of this size or of, of any size that, that's hopefully successful, you know, sometimes it's seven days a week and it's not eight hours a day. It might be 10, 11, 12, 14, 16. What keeps me getting up every day is, is the, the passion I have and the, the, the smile I see on my employees, the belief that they have in myself, my brother, uh, the, the leadership of the company, some of the, the folks that are on our leadership team, the, the passion and belief they have in satisfying and being hopefully the best in the world at what we do. The easiest thing for, for a guy like myself would be to sell and retire and, and go enjoy life. But the folks that work for me and the Ashland community are, are so important to our family for being here 125 years and, and we, wanna, we wanna continue that. So we're instilling that same passion hopefully in the next generation to make a difference, make a difference in your community, be good corporate citizens. You know, I think that pretty much says it all right there. I don't know how you can add to that. No. Good job. Again, thanks for coming. Yeah. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much for joining us on another episode of Wisconsin Eyes Trade Secrets. Join us next time when David will walk us through another great Wisconsin company talking CEO to CEO.